Welcome to a Green Sports Alliance webinar. I know it's been a minute since we've hosted one of these. As many of you may know, we uh, plan our summit for the majority of the year. So uh, happy to uh, be back on track and you guys can look forward to these uh, monthly, you know, until the rest of the year. Um, so today we're going to discuss creating a financial blueprint for renewable energies. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie. I'm the manager of member services and operations for the Green Sports Alliance. If there's any first timers out there, the Green Sports Alliance is a membership driven organization. We are the largest, most influential and initial driver of environmental and social responsibility across the globe for the sports industry. Uh, if you want some more information, you can email me, katie at greensportsalliance.org. Uh, or you can visit our website. And if you haven't had a chance to check it out, um, we released a playbook last this year at the summit uh, called Energy Decarbonization. And today's presentation will mention fundamentals in this playbook. You can scan the QR code uh, to download it now, or you can visit our website and see what other playbooks we've put out in the last year. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can put them in the question box. Uh, don't put them in the chat. They won't pop up to us or to everyone at least. Um, and then if you stick around after the presentation, uh, we'll have some quick updates on GSA and we'll get the answers to those questions for you guys. And I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. We have Ian McDoom, the Senior Director of Engineering and Construction for the Chase Center, home of the Golden State Warriors. And perfect timing, we have Ashley Gladney, the Sustainability Program Manager at the Charlotte Regional Visitors Authority uh, and the Spectrum Center, home of the Charlotte Hornets. And we have Rich Swanson, uh, Director of Climate and Energy at Blue Strike Environmental, uh, Blue Strike has been a sports greening movement partner and a play to zero partner of the Green Sports Alliance uh, for many years now. And now I'm going to pass it to Ian to take off. You're on mute. Morning, everyone. Thanks for that, Katie. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, pleasure speaking to you all today. Um, so coming from San Francisco Chase Center Arena, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of a background um, as Chase Center is an, a new building to the NBA and to the sports infrastructure. Um, so we began construction in 2016. An important part of that is um, at the time of development, we fell under California Title 24 2016 Energy Code. Um, and so with that brought a lot of stipulations as it related to requirements that were brought onto the entitlements of the arena. So one thing I wanted to note there, but Chase Center is not the only building that we uh, manage oversee. Um, it's actually a complex called Thrive City. Thrive City is a uh, mixed use, privately funded 11 acre complex, serves as the home of Chase Center, two 11 story office towers, as well as 30 retail stores and restaurants. What's really unique about that, um, while 11 square acres is is a is a large property, um, all utilities serving the site run through Chase Center, um, and so we have a a little bit more of a mixed energy portfolio. We don't only evaluate our electrical usage um, for just the arena. We're actually um, site agnostic as a whole. Um, currently, as it stands, we're enrolled through a CAA in which we receive 100% renewable energy on site. And one thing that I think is is very special for us, um, we're kind of starting from a, a, while we're a new building, we're also um, kind of in the beginning stages of our energy benchmarking journey. With opening in 2019, we were only open for about eight months before the pandemic hit. So uh, up until last year, we were closed longer than, we, than we've been open. And so as we start ramping up and having more events, um, there's a very unique aspect of the property, and that is in conjunction with Title 24 requirements, as well as our leadership focus and uh, data retention, um, we have power meters on almost all all of our normal power, high voltage and low voltage panels. So that's from 280 down to 120. Um, and those utilize, uh, those power meters are kind of a subset from your general utility meters. Um, we have subsystem meters, which would mean meters on your switch gears, 
And then we have sub panel meters, so panels ranging from 480, 277, uh, 208, 120. We actually have sub panel meters, and then as well as branch circuit meters that make up a, a large portion of our meters on our 277 lighting panels. Um, so we're able to get um, in the in the process now, we're able to get uh, fairly um, ingrained in the data um, to allow ourselves to do a number of things. But we're in the, the beginning of that journey now. And Katie, if you wouldn't mind hopping to that next slide. So uh, kind of on the, the beginning of our journey and, and I, what I will reference for everyone, um, uh, GSA just put out a great playbook on decarbonization in which there's a section in the decarbonization playbook in which we outline metric tracking, benchmarking, establishing a baseline, collecting data, utilizing that data, and leveraging that data. I highly recommend anyone who is um, in the middle or beginning of their journey and understanding how do they leverage their uh, meter data. If you're looking to expand on just utility meters, how do you go about approaching subset meters? I uh, highly recommend going to that playbook. Um, I find myself referencing that playbook quite often as we begin our journey. And that's kind of where we are. We're in the beginning. And so uh, the meters are only so beneficial if you're not able to aggregate uh, and leverage that data. And so we, um, part of that journey for us and some of the journey that uh, some of you all may be going through in the in the world of metering is th there's kind of twofold. Uh, for older buildings, you may just approach energy from utilizing an energy management system that's separate from your uh, building automation system or building management system. Um, that definitely is the way to leverage. Uh, you don't have as much back end control um, with your BMS. For us, um, we are a Johnson Controls Medicis building. And so um, we are taking a little bit more integrated of approach. And so we'll be utilizing JCI OpenBlue uh, in which that will allow us to uh, leverage that data uh, to eventually, hopefully create some integrations to where we can um, leverage uh, reduction of peak load, identify efficiencies, whether that be between HVAC and lighting, um, as well as some other opportunities to improve upon efficiency as a whole. Um, one really unique thing for us as well, again, being in California uh, and under PHME, um, for those who are in California are very aware, we have um, a, a, day, a day of rate charges. And so we have charges based on the time frame of the day. And so in summer, we pay a peak charge um, from four to nine. And so, while this, for us, this data is very beneficial in that a large portion of our utility bill from PG&E is actually a, a demand charge. And so that's a kilowatt hour charge, excuse me, a kilowatt charge, not a kilowatt hour charge that we pay on the peak of draw um, from the grid. And so again, as we go through baselining and having a better understanding of um, what time of our, our kitchen turning on equipment? What time are we ramping on HVAC? What time is our sports lighting coming on? And that way we can develop some strategies to offset some of that peak load. Again, how can we as a stadium uh, in a community that doesn't only serve a stadium help to reduce the load on the grid um, from both a community standpoint and a, and a financial standpoint? Um, and when we talk about ROI and, and a big reason we're, we're making some investments into, uh, you know, this um, software platform, as well as addition of other meters, uh, we do anticipate um, based on the opportunities and demands response programs and reduction of peak load that will have a fairly quick ROI. Uh, and that's mainly based on our uh, overall utility makeup from pg &E. um, But that's kind of at a high level overview. We're, we're very much in the beginning steps of our journey. And, and the importance I wanna stress is that uh, no matter if you're an old or new building, the journey is the same nonetheless. Um, and it's really taking a step back and saying, how do you uh, step past the overall utility metering and leverage a little bit more ingrained data uh, to, again, evaluate things such as your EUI, uh, your peak load, 
um, and, and other energy efficiency strategies to help overall reduce your overall carbon footprint as a whole. So um, appreciate you guys uh, listening to me ramble. Hopefully you found some of that interesting um, and obviously happy to answer any questions later on. And we'll pass it to Ashley. Hello, I'm Ashley Gladney. I am the Sustainability Program Manager for Charlotte Regional Business Authority. Um, I manage this Spectrum Center from back of house perspective with the Charlotte Hornets play. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how our process has been in our energy management and carbon reduction goals. So CRVA and all of CRVA buildings are entities of the city of Charlotte. And in 2020, our city signed the Strategic Energy Action Plan of a goal to become carbon neutral by 2030 in all of the city owned buildings and all of the city owned fleet. So you'll see from this slide, our main focus areas is our buildings, our transportation, our energy generation, and then also the workforce development to make sure as we're moving towards electrification that we have people who can repair and properly maintain these systems. You wanna go to the next slide? <laughs> so, You'll see uh, Spectrum Center has been benchmarking in the city system since 2020. So uh, even though 2020 wasn't the best year to probably start benchmarking our data in the system, it did give us a starting to kind of see where we sit in general in a complete downtime. Um, and then we've continued to benchmark up in two. So our city does run our energy benchmarking in a yearly calendar rather than a fiscal year calendar. So it's January to December. So we get a kind of half a scope of our season into each one. Um, as we'll see, so CRVA and culture facilities are listed on this as one type. They make up 52% of the city's overall square footage. So a huge percentage of the buildings are ones that I directly deal with as it relates to sustainability. And majority of CRVA facilities, including Spectrum Center, reduced their energy consumption from the year 2022 to 2023 by 7.6% with a 5.8% reduction in our carbon emissions, which is a huge feat for us considering how much square footage we have and the fact that we hosted more events at Spectrum Center in 2023 than we did in 2022. Let me go to the next slide. So as I said, we're a little deeper into this process about four years in our city just did a review of where we're really sitting with some of our goals and how we're going to ultimately meet this goal of carbon neutrality in our buildings. So you'll see kind of how our grid is broken down. We work very closely with Duke Energy, who's our main energy provider in the city of Charlotte, to reduce the type of energy we're getting from carbon intense measures. So trying to reduce coal, natural gas usage, et cetera, throughout all of our facilities. So about 56% of our purchased energy already comes from renewable sources, mostly nuclear in the city of Charlotte. And then um, the city has a push to add solar roofing to anything. Um, we have a green source advantage program where we are creating a solar farm right within, slightly outside of the city limits of city of Charlotte. Um, that's gonna help power all of our buildings with solar energy that is actually happily ahead of schedule, so should launch in the next two to three years, which will greatly reduce our purchase energy and scopes emissions in that. So it leaves our city and our buildings with about 19.1% that needs to reduce our energy usage through all of our building. So for Spectrum Center, um, not just because it's a city initiative, but because the Charlotte Hornets as well are very invested in making sure we're a resource to the city and a kind of picturesque of what you should do in the city as one of the premier buildings in the city and premier buildings in the Carolina. So we're very aligned with making sure we can reach these goals. As you guys may or may not know, Spectrum is undergoing multi-phase construction and a lot of this construction will address ways to help us continue to reduce our energy usage, including more LED lighting throughout the building and efficiencies in our system. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Oh, that was into me. So never mind. So that's all I had. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Thank you.
Yeah, and just a reminder, put the put your questions in the Q&A right next to the button is right next to the chat. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over to Rich from Blue Strike. Yeah, great. Thank you, uh, Katie. Thank you, Ashley and, and Ian. Ian, it's uh, it's great to uh, hear the work that that you guys are doing at your uh, respective venues. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks so much for uh, for having us. Um, as you can see, and as you've heard from both Ian and Ashley, uh, venue managers and, and facilities managers and, and uh, the, the entire energy teams um, at, at facilities face an interesting problem. One is often to try to decarb decarbonize operations, as you just heard from Ashley. And then another problem coincident with that one is how to save money on energy. Uh, as you heard from uh, both Ian and Ashley. And if we hop to the next slide, um, the, 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 the questions that are sort of behind those decarbonization and energy questions are things like, do we decarbonize sooner rather than later? How much headway can we make through sort of low cost efficiency measures versus real capital intensive measures? Um, are there energy procurement solutions that can decarbonize our operations sooner than waiting for uh, a clean electricity grid? And possibly could we save money along the way? And if we move ahead, uh, then what are the optimal financing arrangements uh, that we should go ahead and pursue? And, and really the solution to the right decarbonization and energy savings pathway is to kind of choose the right direction, choose the right steps. And so what we do at Blue Strike is, is we leverage our advanced energy analysis capabilities alongside our decarbonization strategy experience to help venues achieve energy cost savings and or carbon reductions. Um, we lean into two uh, in-house tools that we have. Uh, one is called the Climate and Energy Scenario Analysis Tool. That's uh, kind of a techno-economic model that provides investment pathways towards decarbonization. And it takes hundreds of different strategies of inputs from lighting retrofits to energy procurement strategies uh, to, uh, you know, controls, uh, retro controls, a whole host of things at the building level. And, and it puts those in as inputs and then demonstrates either their effectiveness, their cost savings, their energy savings, sort of overall investment value based on a variety of metrics. And then we have another model that we, we also lean into called FARO. Uh, this is a, a facility energy um, resource optimization model. And it takes those scenarios and it optimizes them to ensure that venues are not over overspending to achieve their kind of optimal level of efficiencies and energy savings. And so what that model does, it incorporates all the efficiency measures that I mentioned, plus energy use strategies. And some of them you saw Ian mention, uh, load shifting to move away from time of use uh, pricing, uh, especially high time of use pricing, peak shaving uh, to reduce that demand charge that Ian mentioned. And finally, energy solutions like on-site solar, battery, uh, off-site solutions like a, a green rider that Ashley mentioned and throws those in and then optimizes investment uh, through that modeling process. So if we go to the next slide, um, just to provide an example, we recently worked with the Las Vegas Convention Center and we started by collecting all of their baseline data on all energy consumed all around the convention center, pulling from all of their meters um, and the inventory showed, uh, because we collected not only electricity use, but all energy use, that the vast majority of dollars spent on energy came from electricity. So we wanted to target any uh, decarbonization strategy to electricity, and, and we would have to address that area. And further, the convention center wanted to move faster than the local utility, who did have plans to green their grid, uh, but they just wanted to move in an accelerated fashion. And so if we go to the next slide, um, when, when developing an electricity strategy, we wanted to see how we could accomplish both 
uh, an accelerated reduction of emissions and generate cost savings at the same time. So the first thing we did is we looked at the center's electricity pattern over a two-year time per horizon. In this case, we used 15-minute intervals. And one way to address the cost issue, the energy cost issue, is to examine peak demand. Uh, since large-scale utility customers can expect to pay a demand charge, um, by reducing that peak demand, those charges can be diminished and the overall bill can be lowered. And so it was important for us to identify where those peaks occurred to be sure that any solutions address that aspect. Then if we go to the next uh, slide, we also wanted to control for temperature and occupancy. And as you might expect, electricity was highly correlated with those. Um, in this graphic, we also wanted to be sure that any solution would meet long-term needs for the center. So we applied a machine learning model to generate forecasts, and then we calibrated that model uh, and you can see that calibration uh, happening here. And if you go to the next slide, uh, we then took a look at the center's capacity uh, directly for roof, rooftop solar, so on-site solar uh, delivery using a tool called Helioscope. Um, and then, sorry, the, the next slide too, um, that provided uh, daily uh, that, that provided daily production from that rooftop array of solar panels. And if you skip to the next slide, you'll see some of the output from that. What we did is we, we modeled four investment scenarios, all of which would meet the long-term needs of the convention center. And so you can see here that the cost savings are the delta represented by the shaded sections uh, at the top of each of the bars. Um, so those were savings that would be available for on-site solar. And if we hop to the next slide, we then wanted to model different energy procurement scenarios. Uh, once again, these would all meet the long-term needs of the convention center. And in the Nevada case, these are called green riders. Uh, Ashley also had a picture of some of these on her slides. Uh, under a, a slightly different name, but this is where the utility through the allocation of uh, renewable energy credits in effect sells the center renewable energy from those sources and that program comes at a premium. So in this case, you can see that costs go up marginally from that uh, particular energy sourcing. Um, if you uh, go to the next slide, um, what you can see here is just a table that represents the annual savings and or premiums associated with each strategy that we analyzed. And in the final column, the GHG savings also that are associated with those uh, particular strategies. And then if you flip to the next slide, it's just uh, simply a tabular or a graphical representation of uh, a similar thing. Um, finally, let's go to the next slide. Uh, just to kind of review, we sort of lean into a couple of software tools that we're always developing and refining. Um, our CESA tool is, is really a, a pretty sophisticated cost benefit analysis tool. It's built uh, to mathematically represent the facility's operations. So it tracks uh, energy flows, no matter whether they're coming from natural gas, electricity, uh, whatever it is, into the model itself. And then it measures investment results once the implementation of the measures is scheduled. Uh, and it can do that through a various number of key performance indicators including return on investment, net present value, uh, payback period, et cetera. And then our, our uh, optimization model really optimizes the investment mix between all those energy efficiency and energy structuring or procurement options uh, that we've talked a little bit about. And then we can flip to the last slide. Uh, after we uh, sort of completed our engagement, the con convention center was able to assess how and at what cost they could both, uh, well, they could reduce their net emissions to zero. Um, what they ended up doing was pursuing a special renewable energy purchase arrangement with the local utility. 
And the analysis overall that we did helped them achieve a certification from the Events Industry Council. Uh, and now they have uh, the software tools that uh, remain with, with them to kind of track progress and so forth. Um, so that's it for me. Um, I will turn things back over to Katie. Thank you guys so much. Um, usually we go for about an hour. So you guys, you got all the information in quickly. I think we all love um, a shorter shorter meeting or webinar. Um, we can give some time back. We do have some questions, but want to go over some GSA things real quickly. Uh, if you haven't heard about it yet, we're holding a symposium at the CPKC Stadium in Kansas City on September 19th. This is going to focus heavily on the energy decarbonization playbook, as well as the green built environment. Uh, you can hear Ian and Ashley live, Ian discussing energy tracking, and Ashley is going to talk about how to renovate sustainably. Um, if you're in the sports and sustainability industry, or you're just looking to learn and improve best practices, uh, come join us. You can scan the QR code and register. We only have about 40 seats left, uh, and the hotel block uh, with discounted prices ends next week. And to members, we would love to see you. And to non-members, this is a good opportunity to just come and get your feet wet and networks with some of the folks that um, are members of ours. And finally, Green Sports Day. Many of you know it's just around the corner now. It's on October 6th. Uh, was recognized by President Obama in 2016. Um, it's a day to celebrate with teams, leagues, venues, athletes, and fans uh, what they've done, what they're doing, and what they continue to do throughout the years to make sports and events more sustainable. Uh, and if you're curious to plan what for, for this day, you can join uh, our webinar on September 16th at 10 Pacific, 1 Eastern, you also get a chance to meet uh, some new team members at the Green Sports Alliance. We have Brianna Cook and Taylor Sweet. Uh, you can scan the QR code to register and add it to your calendar. And if you have something planned for this day, we'd love to hear about it and feature you on the webinar. So you can get a hold of me, Katie at greensportsalliance.org. My email is just in the uh, corner on the bottom. And now I'm going to get to questions and answers. So this is from an anonymous attendee for Ian. He says, or she says, are you using open blue to automate operations or just provide insights for facilities management staff to action on? Yeah, right now we're just taking the approach of um, additional vi visibility as a tool for staff. We're not quite yet gonna implement automation. Um, there's a lot of complexity as it relates to the mechanical system here at Chase Center. And so um, while there is already a lot of automation, we didn't want to get into um, automatic set point changes and automatic configuration, seeing as though it's hard to overlay your event schedule on top of the automation as a whole. So that's something that we're looking with, working with JCI on, but overall we're, you know, we're looking forward to their full detection um, system as well as their um, uh, energy manager to help uh, utilize as a tool. Great, and to the anonymous uh, question, uh, hopefully that was answered. If not, you can put uh, some response in the question box again. This one is for Rich. Could you talk about the general time frame, weeks, months, years for the planning you showed at the Las Vegas Convention Center example? Yeah, that's a great question. So the the whole process, which was more than just the energy part, uh, although that was the bulk of it, uh, the engagement was about a year. Um, in other cases, you know, if it's sort of a little more focused, uh, you know, about six months or so is, uh, you know, a, a, a good kind of target time frame for, uh, you know, a relatively in-depth analysis. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I think this question could be for Ashley or Ian. As organizations make decisions to either renovate or build new venues, do you do they reach out to get feedback and ask for suggestions that are working? Uh, 
no, no one has reached out to, to me directly, but I definitely know um, uh, GSA is a, a great um, uh, partner in terms of developers and, and owners looking to uh, develop new buildings um, and have served as a consulting arm to assist, assist with some of those questions. Um, but no, not to me specifically. I'll say for our side, yes, we definitely have reached out to other buildings about how they operate things, um, what they thought of certain systems and various things. It's definitely helpful to hear what other buildings are using, how they're operating, how they like the system. You get sold a lot when you go into renovations. Um, so it's always good to hear kind of people's opinions on various things and how they're working. Um, we also reach out to other city buildings in our area. So definitely some collaboration for us when we look at renovating. Yeah, and um, a lot of those folks that are in this industry will be at the symposium. Um, a lot of architects, a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, energy companies. So uh, if you are interested in in kind of connecting with those folks, we definitely invite you to come. Uh, we will be recording them, the sessions as well, the main stage sessions, uh, so you can watch them later if you can't uh, get over to Kansas City. And we have one last question, um, not specific to anyone. Do you feel implementing these changes will assist the fans in lowering the prices of food, merchandise, and tickets? It's a, that's a very difficult question to answer, and I don't think I'm the best person to answer that question. Um, so I, I will have to defer. <laughs> I'm kind of saying, Miss Ian here, I'm going to defer. I am on back of house services side. So uh, front of house, not much in my control uh, outside of waste diversion. Um, the Green Sports Alliance can probably be helpful with that. We, uh, our partners are very broad. The spectrum is very large on, on who we partner with. So one of our main goals is to get all of these people in one room so we can kind of get on the same page in terms of sustainability. Um, as far as lowering prices for food and merchandise, I think that kind of just has to do with per state and per inflation, but obviously we would all enjoy that. Um, maybe soon to come. <laughs> All right, and that's all the questions that we have. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you wanna get in contact with any of these speakers, you can reach out to me uh, with any questions you may have for them and I can connect you on the side. Uh, we hope to see you in Kansas City and uh, hope to see you for the Green Sports Day webinar as well. Thank you, Ian, Ashley, and Rich so much. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.